Yeah, and Sarah Club. Yeah, Radio Shack and Sarah Club. Oh, so bad. Yeah, this kid from 16 year old. And depending on your TV, it's um, it's wireless. Good evening, everyone. My husband always told me I didn't need a microphone, <laughs> and we're going to test it out. <laughs> it's a pleasure to welcome you all to this program, which is a joint endeavor by the League of Women Voters of Falmouth and Common Cause of Massachusetts. Someone asked me on uh, her way in, are we going to hear both sides of the question? No. <laughs> this, this program is entitled Challenges to Citizens United. And there are many uh, references to that decision and articles on that decision on both sides of the fence. But as far as we're concerned, there's only one side of the fence. Mm -hmm. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan <coughs> political organization. And you may wonder, after what I just told you, how can you say you're nonpartisan? What I mean by nonpartisan is that we never endorse a candidate for a party, but we do take stands on issues. And tonight, you're going to see an example of how we go about advocating for a particular side on an issue. And we come to that particular side after study, discussion, and then consensus. The purpose of the League is to encourage informed and active participation in government. By that I mean uh, we, by voting, by following what's going on in your town, in your state, in the nation, and God forbid, running for office. <laughs> so uh, there are many ways in which you can be an informed, active, and patriotic citizen just by learning about the various sides of issues. Now, we're called the League of Women Voters, but we welcome men and women. So step right up, guys. We have applications <laughs> in the back. Um, our moderator this evening is Margaret Cooper. Margaret has been a member of four leagues in two states. No, she does not flee in a jurisdiction. <laughs> she was very welcome wherever she participated in the league. And as a matter of fact, she's been a volunteer lobbyist for the league in Massachusetts and Virginia. Oh, by the way, I'm Sylvia Shulkin. I try to get away without letting you know. But uh, I'm on the steering committee of the Falmouth League of Women Voters. We have a five-person steering committee in place of a president. Uh, our former president, Deborah Siegel, required five people <laughs> So, Margaret, I'm going to turn the program over to you. Thank you, Sylvia. Well, again, welcome. It's great to see you all here. Before we get started, I'd like to remind you of the sign-up sheets. Can somebody hold up one? There, so there we go. There are a lot of lines on them. And uh, you may not know if you want to sign up for anything at this point, but perhaps after the presentation, you might say, I want more information. You can check that box. You might say, gee, I'd like to help with the campaign. You can check that box. Or you might be willing to put a sign on your lawn saying, vote yes on question four on November 6th. And if you are willing to have a sign, check that box. We'll get in touch with you and get you assigned somehow. We have several speakers this evening. We're on a little bit of a tight schedule because we want to end the prepared remarks at 8.30 so we have half an hour for questions from you, the audience. And we're going to ask you to hold your questions until the end. Can everybody hear me? Good. All right. Our first speaker is Jeff, Jeffrey Oppenheim. He's a longtime local attorney. He's a town meeting member. And he presented a resolution regarding Citizens United at town meeting, which did pass. He's going to talk about the facts and the rulings of Citizens United versus the Federal Elections Commission. 
thank you to the league and uh, to Deborah for getting me involved in this uh, <laughs> almost six months ago or something, whenever that was. Um, and uh, I want to thank Judy Sis, who was my research assistant, uh, both uh, for this evening and also for, for town meeting. I had, I had help in getting ready for uh, uh, my uh, presentation uh, uh, at the town level. Um, I'm not a constitutional law expert. I'm a local attorney. I frankly very rarely have the opportunity to deal in constitutional issues uh, in my practice. Um, so it was very interesting for me to be involved, be involved in town meeting and, and uh, again this evening. Um, so I'm not going to be advocating in my remarks this evening. I'm going to try to give you uh, what I would call the Reader's Digest version of, of this decision. Why the Reader's Digest version? Not because you're not bright enough to understand it, but more because it's a 183 page decision. And I have 10 or so minutes <laughs> to uh, somehow you know, tell you what I think uh, is important about the decision. Okay, so um, obviously it was a Supreme Court decision. Um, uh, it was decided in January 2010, so it's less than three years old. Uh, it reversed a decision of a three panel uh, U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia. The vote at the Supreme Court level was five to four. The holding of the decision um, is uh, that the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act of 2002, which some of us, or most of us, I think know as the McCain-Feingold Bill, uh, or just McCain-Feingold, um, uh, that it violated the First Amendment guarantee of free speech uh, insofar as it prohibited corporations from making expenditures from general corporate funds to finance, quote, electioneering communications shortly before an election or a primary. So in reaching this decision, the court said its earlier decisions uh, specifically in the Austin case, was wrong. So they overturned a previous decision, not something they do uh, frequently or lightly. And we'll, we'll get to the Austin case a little bit later. Um, and uh, the Supreme Court specifically asked the parties to file briefs, which are you know, legal uh, documents explaining their position on the question of whether Austin should be overruled. Now, now for the facts of the case, the boiled, again, boiled down version. Uh, Citizens United was a nonprofit corporation which was supported by donations. Most of the donations came from individuals, but some of them came for, from for-profit corporations. During the 2008 campaign season, uh, Citizens United released a movie in theaters and on DVD. And that movie was critical of Hillary Clinton. Um, it also wanted to uh, make these movies available through video on demand and to promote movie, uh, uh, promote movie ads and broadcast and cable television. Now there was a cable company that was willing to broadcast this, uh, this movie uh, on their video on, uh, on demand programming if Citizens United paid them $1.2 million. So Citizens United realized that if they proceeded to do that, that they might um, violate the McCain-Feingold bill. So they kind of preempted that by suing the Federal Election Commission, which is our federal agency that's supposed to uh, administer uh, and uh, uh, the, the McCain-Feingold bill. So this uh, suit was brought in the Federal District Court in Washington, um, and uh, they were seeking to uh, an opinion that said that their plan would not violate the McCain-Feingold bill. Well, um, uh, it also asked the court prevent the Federal Election Commission from challenging the plan. So 
So at the district court, the federal district court uh, level, they ruled against Citizen United and their, and their plan. So what did they do? They appealed to a Supreme Court uh, who reversed the decision, which is why we're here this evening. Five justices wrote opinions um, in the Citizens United case. Um, and we'll go through most of those opinions. Um, uh, and as I said, the, all of the opinions total 183 pages. Um, so Justice Kennedy was uh, one of the dissenters um, in, in, in the Austin case, which you'll hear a little bit more about in a minute. And uh, he wrote the opinion for the majority of the court, for the five, for the five justices who uh, ruled um, in, in favor of the Citizens United. Um, there were two concurring opinions. One of them was Justice Roberts, and the other one was Justice Scalia. And each of those concurring opinions was supported or joined by Justice Alito. Now, the dissent was led by Justice Stevens. And he was joined by uh, the other three dissenting justices, which were Ginsburg, Breyer, and Sotomayor. So the concurring opinions of Justice Roberts dealt with several preliminary issues. Um, Justice Roberts wanted to decide the case on narrower grounds, which is not an unusual thing for the Supreme Court. They tend to try to want the decision not to be too expansive. Um, and uh, he, he wanted to try to avoid the constitutional issues. Um, well, that didn't happen. Um, uh, Justice Alito wrote a concurring opinion discussing the intent of our original framers of the First Amendment. Essentially, he entered into a debate, uh, a written debate, with uh, Justice Stevens on, on this issue. Uh, Justice Stevens, uh, his, his uh, dissenting opinion um, addressed all of the issues in the case, and he wrote the most of any of the justices. So let's first go to the uh, majority opinion. Uh, Justice Kennedy made the following uh, important points. Again, we're distilling this case down to you know, some of the essentials. Uh, he said that the law banned corporate speech the right of a corporation to have a, uh, a PAC, a political action, political, political action committee, was not a sufficient substitute for the expenditure from, corporate, from the corporate treasury because a PAC does not permit the corporation itself to speak and because the regulations regarding PACs are burdensome. So that's why we have now super PACs because of this decision. Any ban on speech Justice Kennedy said, must be given strict scrutiny. Um, he made the distinction um, between categories of speakers. Um, uh, and he also made a distinction um, uh, on the uh, past um, to protect government functions, such as limiting the speech of prisoners. So he made some distinctions on speech that the court had previously limited. Um, turning to the First Amendment part of, the, of, of this, um, which I think is probably the most important to all of us, um, he listed a number of cases which uh, preceded this case um, on the First Amendment issues. He acknowledged the long history of legislation that banned campaign expenditures by corporations um, and legislation which had not been challenged. So he looked at three cases in particular. The, the Buckley case, which uh, concluded that there was a difference between limits on campaign contributions and limits on independent expenditures. Uh, he looked upon campaign contributions as presenting a danger of actual corruption, which he called a quid pro quo corruption, or the appearance of corruption. The court did not have the same problem with limits on independent expenditures because of the absence 
of prearrangement, quote, and coordination. So uh, this is language right out of the decision. In, in Buckley, the court considered the First Amendment rights generally without separately considering the rights of corporations and whether those rights were the same as the rights of individuals. And that, I think, is uh, you know, a, a focal point uh, of this whole decision. The second case that, uh, that um, Justice Kennedy looked at was a Massachusetts case, the Bilotti case. And, and uh, in that case, the court struck down a Massachusetts law that limited independent expenditures in referendums, not, you know, not for candidates, but for referendum items. Justice Kennedy recognized that the court did not rule on independent expenditures on behalf of candidates rather than independent expenditures in referendums. But he stated his assumption that the court also would have rejected limits on independent expenditures in political campaigns for candidates. The third case, which is the Austin case, Justice Kennedy found a, a conflict between Buckley, which I just mentioned, and Bellotti on the other hand, and Austin as the, as the third case. Speaking for the court, he concluded that the court should overrule Austin and follow the pre-Austin precedent. So let's talk for a moment about Austin. This was a case that was decided in 1990. The vote was seven to two. Justice Kennedy and Scalia were in the, the two dissenting judges. The case involved the Michigan State Chamber of Commerce's uh, challenge to a Michigan law which prohibited corporations from making expenditures from its general treasury in connection with state elections. So uh, in support of this law, Michigan made what has been called an anti-distortion argument. Anti-distortion anti means um, that corporations are in a position to amass great wealth in part because of their corporate form. Um, and there may be a disconnect between the wealth that they amass and the extent to which they're able to push a position that's important on um, you know, an election. Uh, their wealth, uh, in essence, can corrode and distort an election campaign. That's really what it comes down to. The Supreme Court accepted Michigan's argument and held that the Chamber of Commerce could be prohibited from making uh, uh, campaign expenditures. They also pointed out that the Chamber of Commerce had an alternative. Uh, and they could use their uh, um, funds uh, through a PAC, Political Action Committee, um, to try to express their opinion that way. So they saw that as uh, an alternative means of expressing their First Amendment rights. Uh, so that, that's uh, the third important uh, case that was uh, discussed heavily by Justice uh, Kennedy. Um, so Justice Kennedy saw a conflict with this Austin case. He had to do something to explain it away. Um, and. Uh, he said um, that, um, that it wasn't an anti-distortion situation. Uh, he said the danger of quid pro quo corruption or the appearance of corruption um, refers to actual exchange of expenditures for favors or the appearance of such exchange. And he also said that the protection of dissenting shareholders, in other words, some shareholders, the shareholders who don't agree with the corporation's position that they're trying to advance uh, <coughs> it should, should uh, not be considered, essentially, mm -hmm. if they're a minority. Um, so, um, so Justice Kennedy, writing for the court, uh, rejected the anti-distortion argument. He pointed out that, gov that government Agency sued by Citizen United didn't press didn't press their case strongly. 
He denied the anti-distortion uh, anti uh, argument. He said that government had no interest in equalizing the ability of individuals and groups in an election. Um, he said it also shouldn't matter to government whether the public supported the corporation's point of view or not. Um, he looked at the scope of the law. He pointed out that it was not designed to protect against distortion of elections. Um, he also put forth what is called uh, a, a parade of horribles. Uh, the risk that corporations could be prevented from publishing books or uh, other media uh, might be restricted by a, a decision um, against uh, Citizens United. I'm going to jump, jump to Justice Stevens, okay, who wrote for the yeah, dissent. Yeah, okay, the dissent is very important to us. Um, uh, so I was asked, one of the things I was asked to do was to point out the dangers of the decision. Um, and my response to Sylvia was that Justice Stevens, in his dissent, point, points out all the dangers. You know, I, you don't need to hear it from me. You can hear it from Justice Stevens. Uh, he disagreed that the law was a ban on the corporation's exercise of First Amendment rights because the corporations have an ability to use PACs to voice their opinion. Um, uh, he said that the courts had no record on which to base a ruling that PACs, which were in existence, were, were burdensome or, or restricted First Amendment rights too much. Um, he also uh, addressed um, whether a corporation can be treated differently from an individual. Um, he uh, looked at the three cases that Justice Kennedy cited, and he um, disagreed that Austin was inconsistent with the Buckley and Bellotti decisions. Uh, he said the Bellotti case, he said the risk of quid pro, uh, quid pro quo corruption is less in a re referendum so he distinguished that case because it was about referendum than in a campaign in which a candidate is seeking office. Regarding the Buckley case, he noted that no one bothered to argue that the bar on corporate expenditures was unconstitutional, even though virtually every other provision of the law was challenged. And in Austin, um, uh, he said that the case had been reaffirmed a number of times and it should be followed. He then made a distinction between corporations and individuals. Uh, 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 he, he said that it was acceptable under our system and that we should allow it. He urged that the identity of a speaker can be considered when the government has a legitimate interest to consider it. For example, um, you know, w would the majority uh, allow Congress the power to prohibit expenditures by foreign controlled corporations? You know, uh, he cited that as an example. Uh, he noted that the majority never explained why corporations are entitled to the same rights as individuals. Um, he pointed out that a substantial body of legislation um, uh, was directed at corporations already uh, and, and, and you know, limited their activities. Uh, pointed to the absence of any constitutional challenge to the law at issue for a, a substantial period of time. Um, since you know, McCain-Feingold came in for sure. Um, then he looked to the history, he, he talked about what uh, he thought the, the framers envisioned um, in giving corporations the same level of protection as individuals. Um, so he, he was obviously trying to uh, debunk all the prior arguments. He emphasized that anti-corruption, um, that, that Congress lied, relied on facts before it that showed how expenditures buy influence and access even if they don't amount to quid pro quo corruption. He also stated that the court owed Congress deference, that Congress had passed this legislation and they should, they should defer to it. Um, and that there, there, there was no factual record um, for a basis um, that uh, uh, corporate expenditures would not corrupt. Um, you may have seen already that it has corrupted our system. Um, he also stated that corporate expenditures have become functionally interchangeable with direct corporate 
contributions in terms of their influence on candidates. So, um, uh, he confirmed his support for the whole anti-distortion argument, which was advanced in, in Austin. Um, he, he distinguished between a corporation which has a perpetual life, uh, limited liability, separation of ownership from control, and favorable treatment and accumulation of ass assets. He talked about corporations having generally more assets than individuals, uh, corporations not having a conscience, beliefs, feelings, desires, any of the things that we attribute to uh, human beings. Um, uh, they can't, the corporations can't speak for themselves. They're supposed to speak by proxy. Um, uh, and uh, he, he noted that the, the majority uh, emphasize the right of the public to hear the corporation's point of view, and uh, the public has not asked for this right. Um, so, in a nutshell, I'm sure I'm way over my time, that's what uh, the decision is. Our next speaker is Sylvia Shulkin, again. She's a retired attorney, and she's been a member of two local leagues, one in Falmouth, and she's also been a member of the Framingham League. <coughs> She's going to talk about the League of Women Voters' position on Citizens United. The League does take stand on issues. Here she is. At its convention this past June, the League of Women Voters of the United States passed a resolution to strongly advocate, and I'll uh, quote, advocate for all appropriate duly considered measures, including but not limited to a constitutional amendment to allow Congress and the states to set reasonable regulations on campaign contributions and expenditures and to ensure that elections are determined by the voters. The League's support of a constitutional amendment in this case should be no surprise. The League has taken a number of other positions that are consistent with its position in, in uh, supporting a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United. The League, for example, has been working for decades to bring about real reform to campaign finance. The League has also taken stands to facilitate citizen participation in government decision making and keeping with its stand on the public's right to know, the League is currently urging its members to lobby the media for more vigorous, timely fact-checking to examine claims made in political ads and debates. Several years ago, the League co-sponsored legislation in Congress to require the media to grant some prime time, free air time to all candidates during an election season so that candidates could compete more equitably for public office. Uh, unfortunately, that legislation didn't get very far for a number of reasons. And the League doesn't always succeed, but we're not clear. <laughs> Thank you, Sam. Our next speaker is Deborah Siegel. She's a town meeting member, and she's a been a past president of our local leagues. And Deborah is going to tell us about the resolution on Citizens United that Jeff presented and was passed by Tom. <clears throat> Sylvia asked me to read first to you the article that we presented to town meeting. It said, to see if the town will vote to adopt a resolution as follows. We, the members of the Falmouth Town Meeting, affirm our belief that the First Amendment to the United States Constitution was designed to protect the free speech rights of people, not corporations. We believe that the United States Supreme Court's ruling in Citizens United versus the FEC, which allows corporations and unions to give unlimited funds to advocacy groups to influence elections, and the billions of dollars corporations spend in lobbying greatly outweighing amounts spent by unions and public interest groups, threaten democracy by allowing corporations to cause the election of candidates who will serve themselves, not ordinary citizens. 
The people of the United States, through their legislators, have previously amended the Constitution to regulate elections and federal office holding nine times. Now, therefore, be it resolved that we, the members of Falmouth Town Meeting, call upon the United States Congress to pass and send to the states for ratification a constitutional amendment to specify that constitutional personhood rights are for natural persons only and to restore the people's rights to fairness in elections and influence on government policy. And further, we call upon the Massachusetts General Court to pass one or more resolutions asking those actions or do or take any action, other action in this matter <coughs> on request of Alexander Ziss and others. So that was the article that was brought to town meeting. It was brought by Judy and Alex Ziss and they decided that they needed the advice of some town meeting members and asked for a few of us to help in that capacity. We knew that there were several critical needs. Uh, the first was that we needed to have a town meeting member to introduce the article who spoke well and was highly respected and untainted by other battles and issues. <laughs> <laughs> there he is. That was our man at town meeting. The second thing that was critical was to convince town meeting members that Article 25 was nonpartisan because the Citizens United decision was adversely affecting every political party and people from all political persuasions. The third critical need was to convince town meeting that this amendment, and therefore the article, were within the scope of local town meeting business. Now, I can tell you that if you bring something to town meeting and you can't convince town meeting that it's not within the scope of the article, it's the kiss of death. The way we went about convincing town meeting that this was in the scope of the article was first by convincing them that unrestricted corporate spending was not limited to presidential elections, but that it could filter down to the local level and pollute the le debate on local issues. For instance, uh, we cited zoning changes, the casino debate, school committee elections, and we told them about one in, that had happened in Denver, where $600,000 was spent to change the balance in favor of privatization of the schools. We also wanted to make town meeting understand that small businesses can be pitted against large corporations with unlimited funds. Uh, they can come in and do a lot of political advertising. They can influence tax and trade policies to monopolize markets, and thereby they drown out local voices. Uh, one of the things that you learn when you're a town meeting member and you've gone to battle on anything is that you must convince or at least have discussion with town meeting members who are respected and influential. And therefore, those of us, the several of us who were working on this, who were town meeting members, started calling town meeting members that we knew. And we tried to engage them in the, in the discussion and try to even get them to speak in favor of Article 25. Um, a number of the people that I talked to, I spent a lot of time with. And <laughs> And usually when we got off the phone, what they said to me was, well, you presented a good case, uh, I respect you, and I need to hear more on town meeting floor. And what are you going to say? So I said, well, Jeff Oppenheim is going to present it. And they all said, oh, well, I'll, I'll be sure to listen to that. <laughs> and indeed they did. Uh, when it time, came time for the, for the vote, uh, there was a voice vote first, and that wasn't clear, so the moderator asked for a standing vote. And the article was, to my shock, passed by a vote of 103 in favor and 69 opposed. And uh, I, I do think that the homework that we did and the conversations we had with people 
um, made a big difference. And Jeff did a, did a wonderful job at presenting it. And um, the, the, the town clerk, Michael Palmer, then sent this to, to our state legislators. And uh, it's now on the books. So that was, um, that was it in a nutshell. Yeah. <laughs> you might be interested that 73 cities and towns in Massachusetts have passed resolutions to undo the holdings in Citizens United. They're not all phrased the same way, but they all boil down to a constitutional okay. so, I'm sorry to say we won. I must have counted. <laughs> There are two, two, uh, there are two towns or cities that have passed multiple resolutions. Cambridge um, and Leverett have each passed. So if you saw a list, you might have seen it. Double count. I saw the 73 somewhere. Yeah. I need to tell you that we were going to have two slides up here, mm -hmm. but we don't have the capability. One slide says vote yes on question four, November 6th. That's why we're here, to convince you and everybody you know to vote yes on question four. The other slide gave you the text of question four. And I didn't bring my typewritten sheet. Tyler will give you the wording. It's also on the flyers in the back. And it's on the flyers that, that you can pick up. So this is an attempt to educate the public on voting yes on question four. And you're going to hear more about that from Tyler Creighton. Tyler came all the way from Boston to, um, he's from Common Cause, and he's their state field director. And he led the petition drive to get this question on the ballot. Some of you signed petitions, and it worked, and it's on the ballot, both in the district, of Representative Tim Madden and Representative David Vieira, and actually, we're supposed to read those statements before Tyler talks. So why don't you read the statement from David? This is what David Vieira had to say about his vote in favor of a constitutional amendment to undo the holdings of Citizens United. The recent decision by the Supreme Court of the United States to depart with a long tradition of protecting our democracy from unfettered influence of money in politics should be concerning to all Americans. As state representative for the third Barnstable District, I support House 4375, that was the name of the bill, an amended resolution calling for a constitutional amendment defining the rights listed in the Constitution as the rights of human individuals and not corporations, unions, political action committees, and super political action committees. The original resolution submitted was, in my opinion, inflammatory and poorly written. The bipartisan support for the concept prevailed, and a redrafted resolution resulted. I can't help but reflect on the clear, and it's quote, clear and present danger principle introduced to US jurisprudence by former Chief Dust Justice of the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court and Associate Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, Oliver Wendell Holmes. The principle introduced in the 1990 case, 1919 case, Schenck versus United States, is most notable for the prohibition on falsely shouting fire in a crowded theater. However, the part that I believe best applies to the Citizens United case reads in part the question in every case is whether the words are used in such circumstances and are of such a nature as to create a clear and present danger that they will bring about substantive evils that Congress has a right to present. The unfettered funding of campaigns and often the divisive nature of the messages paid for by anonymous entities on both sides of the political aisle are, in my sub opinion, substantive evils which Congress should prevent. In closing, now more than ever, we individual citizens of the United States 
must be vigilant vanguards of our democratic way of life. We must ardently protect the rights codified in the U.S. Constitution and endowed upon us by our Creator. In defining these rights as those of individuals, we, must, we will take an important step forward and begin to curb the troublesome and dangerous influence of money on the American political system. Oh, oh. Here is what our representative, Timothy Madden, has to say. He's sorry that he can't come tonight. And he says, I co-sponsor Senator Eldridge's legislation because I truly feel our Supreme Court got it wrong. I believe that most corporate boards feel they have a financial obligation to improve their company's bottom line and make their decisions based on who or what to donate to, based on that premise. I believe individuals decide things regarding who they will support and how they'll vote on many factors. Personal experience, moral or political beliefs, religious convictions, and perhaps even based on financial factors. But it should always be the individual's personal decision as to where their campaign financial support should be directed. By virtue of owning stock in a company, one should not lose that freedom of choice in terms of whether to offer financial support to a particular candidate or cause that they themselves do not believe in. I hadn't heard that argument before. Someone recently sent me this quote from President Obama and I think it sums up my feelings on this issue. When asked on Reddit about the corrupting influence of money in politics, Obama said, money has always been a factor in politics, but we're seeing something new in the no holds barred flow of seven and eight figure checks, most undisclosed, into super PACs they fundamentally threaten to overwhelm the political process over the long run and drown out the voices of ordinary citizens. We need to start with passing the Disclose Act that's already been written and sponsored by Congress to at least force disclosure of who is giving what to who. We should also pass le legislation prohibiting the bundling of campaign contributions from lobbyists. Over the longer term, I think we need to seriously consider mobilizing a constitutional amendment process to overturn Citizens United. Even if the amendment process falls short, it can shine a spotlight of the super PAC phenomenon and help apply pressure for change. Thank you for allowing me to express my views. And now, Tyler Creighton from Common Cause. Good evening, everybody. Uh, Tyler Creighton from, from Common Cause. Uh, I'd like to thank Margaret for, for letting us come here and speak to you guys today on the ballot question um, and, and Citizens United and the, the movement for a constitutional amendment. I think that. Um, that quote by Obama is particularly important um, in that it shows that the work that we've been doing, whether it's town meeting, Falmouth, or the ballot question, is bringing this issue up to the national level. And that's really what we have to do at the end of the day. You know, Ob Obama's coming out with a statement um, you know, from the highest, the highest person in the, in the country saying that he supports a constitutional amendment. And that's, we need that support at, at the end of the day if this is really going to be um, something that happens. As I'm sure many of you know, constitutional amendment isn't the easiest thing um, to pass. So we have quite a long road ahead of us, but I'm glad that you guys are here. We're just at the, the very beginning of um, what is sure to be a long fight. So I was asked uh, to come and talk about how and why the, the referendum down the ballot, the likely effects of its passage, and future steps 
uh, going down the road. So the, the idea of this ballot question um, was conceived of um, early on this year. Um, there's been a group of, of activists working on a constitutional amendment across the country and in Massachusetts for you know, a, a roughly a year or two. Um, in Massachusetts, there's a group called the Democracy Amendment Coalition of Massachusetts, which is made up of Common Cause, Move to Amend, um, the League has been part of it um, for some time, um, a lot of the Occupy groups, they've been meeting and trying to figure out the best way to bring this issue to the front. Um, and one of the, the ways was by ballot question. Another way was by, by uh, passing town resolutions, which there have now been 71 passed of 361 total. Um, so to, to put a question on the ballot, you need to collect um, a certain number of signatures. In our area, we collected, in this area here, we collected um, enough signatures to put it on two state representative district ballots, both uh, Timothy Madden's and David Pierre's. And that required 200 certified signatures per district. Um, and then they also did the entire Cape and Islands area as well as the Senate district that required 1,200 signatures. Um, both were very impressive efforts, and I'm glad um, that you all succeeded. I know Bill Maurer back there um, did sort of a last minute effort to get the question on the ballot in Falmouth, um, as well as other people here. Um, in total, the, the question is going to be on the ballot in 30 state representative districts and six state senate districts, which comprises about a third of all Massachusetts voters. Um, which was a, a pretty big feat considering the short timeline for which we were operating in and the fact that it was a purely volunteer effort. Um, I think that I was the only paid staff member in the state that was working on this ballot question. So we, we were really relying on you know, people um, like Bill um, to, to get out there on the weekends and hit the grocery store, hit the farmer's market, hit the community events and, and collect signatures. And from my experience doing it, um, people were very receptive and they realized how absurd it is that we have a Supreme Court saying that unlimited corporate expenditures are not corrupting our de democratic process. They realize that that is ridiculous and um, they support us. Um, they, they support us across, across the, the state. Um, so in terms of the, the likely effects of its passage, um, there's a number of things that, that why I think that this ballot question is important. Um, one, there's, there's a tradition of using ballot questions or voter instructions to inform or directly petition um, our um, state leaders and our, our federal leaders to act on policy that we would like to see. Um, the 17th Amendment is a great example of that. Um, the 17th Amendment is allows for the direct election of senators. That process was started by ballot questions. Um, so there, there's a tradition of doing this. Um, I think there's something to be said about that. Um, as many of you know, and we were just hearing, there was a state resolution passed by the state legislature um, in support of a constitutional amendment. It was passed unanimous, unanimously in the House, and there was only one dissenting vote in the Senate. Um, that is great, um, and this ballot question is only gonna reinforce that. So we have the state legislators that have gone out and been on record in support of the constitutional amendment, and now we need all of you and, and the people of Massachusetts to double down on, on what they're saying mm -hmm. and say that not only is the highest legislative institution in Massachusetts in support of this, but its general population is mm -hmm. as well. And that's, that's also a very important. It's gonna send a strong message to Congress and our senators that their constituents wanna see a constitutional amendment and um, if it's not coming, you know, we can find someone else to, to do your job for you. Um, the other big thing is that it's a huge educational campaign. Um, Citizens United is, is a court case from almost three years ago now, um, but a lot of people still don't know about it. Um, and even those that do know about it, the, and they know about super PACs, and they are not aware that anything's going on to stop it. Um, they don't know that there's a, this movement for a constitutional amendment that's just now growing. And this ballot question really, it, it's gonna be in your face because you're gonna see it, see it at the ballot, 
um, see it at the ballot box, you're going to see it in your local newspapers, um, and, and that, that's very important as well. The other thing um, is going to build momentum for us to hopefully do a statewide question in 2014. As I was saying, we were only able to do it by legislative districts, so not the entire state is going to be voting on it. Hopefully in 2014 um, we can do a statewide and have the entire um, population vote on it. It also builds momentum for other states to follow suit. Um, there has been, um, across the country, different states doing things like Massachusetts. There are now eight states that have passed resolutions through their legislature. Um, Maryland, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Hawaii, uh, New Mexico, California, and uh, I think that was eight there in Massachusetts. Um, and then this year as well, there's going to be a statewide ballot question in Montana and in Colorado, <coughs> which common co the Common Cause Colorado and Common Cause Montana helped collect signatures for. They collected uh, over 100,000 signatures mm -hmm. in Colorado and about 40,000 in Montana. Um, and they believe that uh, those, both of those ballot questions will pass in November. Um, so we're very, very excited about that. Now, in terms of future steps, um, it is my opinion and opinion of Common Cause that the, the constitutional amendment is really the only long-term mm -hmm. permanent solution to um, addressing the, the ramifications of Citizens United as well as other court decisions like Buckley. Because um, not only do we have excessive corporate money, but we have excessive individual money as well. Citizens United didn't say a word about what individuals could spend in elections. It only talked about corporations and unions. And uh, you know, there, at the end of the day, there's gonna need to be a constitutional amendment if we want to see any sort of uh, reigning in of the excessive super PACs and the excessive 501c4s that are spending um, obscene amounts of money. In the meantime, however, there are important reforms that we can uh, put in place that would uh, mitigate a lot of the problems that Citizens United has um, caused. A big thing is further disclosure. Um, the Disclose Act was mentioned at the federal level. Um, that's a very important bill that would um, prevent these 501c4s that Karl Rove and others um, are using to spend unlimited amounts of money in an undisclosed fashion. Um, and they're using, and they're also tax exempt as well. Um, really taking advantage of an IR, IRS um, code that uh, should not should not be there. There is also disclosure that we can enact at the state level. Um, Common Cause has supported a disclosure bill um, S two three seven five, which actually passed the Senate unanimously um, last legislative session, but never came up to vote in the House. Um, and the session ended before it came up to vote. And that law um, would close a lot of the loopholes that Citizens United opened. Um, previously, you know, corporations were not allowed to make expenditures in state elections. So there was no need to have disclosure requirements because they weren't allowed to make them in the first place. However, there hasn't been a law passed since Citizens United struck down those corporate expenditure bans to uh, require disclosure of them. So at the moment, individuals are required to disclose, whereas corporations are not. Um, and that was something that we lobbied on very hard. Um, and unfortunately, for some internal politic reasons, um, it did not go through, through. But we will be pushing it again next year. Another thing is shareholder approval, um, something that a lot of different groups are pushing to give shareholders greater say over the money that their corporations are spending. Um, another short-term solution um, that could be passed before a uh, constitutional amendment. Other, other things um, have to do with fair elections, which we used to have in Massachusetts, um, but were, was unfortunately revoked by the state legislature, um, of doing small donations that were matched, or a voucher system that Sir Lawrence Lessig is a big proponent of a number of fair election solutions that would help mitigate the problem. Um, or uh, issues of equal airtime. There's a whole bunch of other reforms that could be put in place that would really help um, 
like, like, like I said, mitigate the, the issues of Citizens United. Um, so, the text. The text of the the text of the ballot question. Very good. Um, so the text of the ballot question. It's a it's a it's a little confusing, unfortunately. Um, the the Secretary of State requires that every public policy question of which this question is um, to begin with the statement, shall my state representative or shall my state senator be instructed to vote in favor of a resolution calling on Congress to propose a constitutional amendment affirming that corporations do not enjoy the same constitutional rights as people and that Congress and states can place limits on political contributions and expenditures. Uh, the reason why I say it's kind of confusing is because we're instructing our state representative to, um, in essence, pass a resolution that has already been passed. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to say that that doesn't make the, the, the ballot question irrelevant. Um, the only reason it's worded that way is because they, they make us word it that way, but it, you, it should be seen as a direct petition to Congress. What you're saying by voting yes is that you want your, your our congressional delegation here in Massachusetts to propose a constitutional amendment affirming those two principles. Uh, you know, disregard the, the resolution that's already been passed. That's how it's gonna be seen from the outside, that there's overwhelming majority in support of this, um, they're not seeing it as they're supporting a resolution, they're seeing it as you're supporting directly a constitutional amendment. Um, so one other, one other sort of hiccup with uh, regard to the ballot question is unfortunately numbered differently throughout the state. So while you guys are gonna be voting on question four, um, people in Boston are gonna be voting on question five. Yeah. People in Cambridge are gonna be voting um, on anything between question four and seven, depending on where they live in the town. And that is another huge issue, um, huge barrier that is part of the, the rules and regulations of our state, um, which make ballot questions um, just very cumbersome, um, in addition to the, the signature process, which can be very cumbersome. So the other things that I just wanted to touch on before I finish here was the things that you can do, which um, Margaret and company put on the back of the, the flyer here. Um, so the big things, you know, talking to other friends and neighbors about this, um, joining visibility events, which I know Bill is going to be organizing, um, particularly as the election approaches. I'm sorry, um, standing on the street corner with vote yes on four, putting it in your, um, in your lawn, covering the, the polls on election day with signs and literature, um, distributing, distributing the literature at community events, or if you're going to a, a party, a friend's party, you know, make sure you're talking about, talking about the issue and, and that people are aware of it, um, and that they, that they know that, they're, that this question is on the ballot. Um, so I think, in general, people are in favor of this. There was just a, another poll that came out um, yesterday, actually, that has, you know, 85% of people feeling very concerned with the effects of Citizens United and unlimited expenditures and elections. Um, there was a poll back in 2011 of just Massachusetts people that across the political spectrum, whether, whether you're Democrat, Independent, or Republican, they're all in the 80s of people that see that Citizens United has a negative effect on our political process. You know, th this, this question, the constitutional amendment is supported. All we need to do is put the pressure on the officials and make it, make it an issue, not just a, a thought in your head. So get involved in this election cycle. I know there's a lot of other um, important uh, candidate elections going on as well, but uh, there's a time for both. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, there, a lot of people think, oh, if we can just elect Democrats to, to uh, Congress and we can just keep Obama, that somehow all of these issues of excessive expenditures in, in elections are just going to go away. And, you know, if we put the right people on the Supreme Court, they can overturn that decision. You know, maybe, but uh, I'm not very confident in that myself. So, thank you for having me. questions now and I, I'm going to ask the speakers to all stand up and I'm going to ask um, 
those of you who have questions to stand, form a line right here so that you can I think I'm going to ask you to do here so you can ask the question <coughs> anybody can answer it I've heard that the Citizens United ruling, which does apply now, has overturned many state laws. Right. Can somebody address that? Which, do you know of any yeah. laws that have been overturned? There were, I think, 28 states or some, somewhere in that, in that uh, range that had laws in the books that banned corporate expenditures in state elections, and Massachusetts being one of them that, that had that. Um, and they took that law off the books knowing that it was going to be challenged. Um, there's a great story that many of you might, may have heard of about Montana that uh, they, they had also had a similar law and they decided to keep theirs on the books um, and say, no, you know, we, we actually think that our law holds up even with the Citizens United ruling because we have been here and we see that corporate expenditures are corrupting our elections. Um, and we don't, essentially we completely disagree with what, with what uh, you have just said. And um, that, the, uh, a non, another nonprofit ended up um, suing the state and it got up to the uh, Supreme Court again. Supreme Court didn't even hold a hearing on it. Um, they just um, essentially released a, a very short statement um, affirming their Citizens United decision um, without any real further discussion. Um, so that, that is one. Okay. So when you um, ask your question, please be brief and try not to duplicate anybody else's question. And David, you want to ask the first one here? Anybody else? Come on up, stand here. I actually have a fairly <laughs> rudimentary question. I was wondering if you could explain the difference between a pack and a super pack and uh, what the differences are in both the guidelines and also uh, how they operate. Yeah, I'm happy to. There is a little bit in the, that blue sheet back there um, that touches on that. So the, the first thing is defining the difference between um, independent expenditures and contributions. So independent expenditures is uh, any money spent on behalf of a not given directly to that candidate, or its party, or its political action committee, i.e. PACs. So any money that's given to PACs or um, par parties or candidates is considered a direct contribution. And those are distinguished between independent expenditures. Um, PACs can only accept contributions, um, and contributions are severely capped. So you can, uh, you can donate $5,000 to a PAC uh, per election cycle. On the other hand, super PACs are, are uh, so-called independent expenditure only PACs. So they only can take in independent expenditures, they can't, um, and therefore they can't uh, coordinate their spending with a candidate or with another PAC, but they can take unlimited amounts. Does that answer your question? It's a, it's a little confusing, but there's, there's a, a good chunk in, in that uh, blue page, I believe, that goes over that. I, I wanted to mention in connection with your question uh, about the fallout from, from Citizens United. Uh, there was a suit, and I don't recall what state, and it's still going up the line, the appellate line, but a corporation that runs a slaughterhouse brought a suit against the FDA, uh, the uh, Called the Federal Department of Agriculture, uh, seeking a ban on unannounced visits to slaughterhouses <laughs> as a violation of the corporation's Fourth Amendment rights. In other words, if a corporation has the same constitutional rights as the First Amendment rights of an individual, why doesn't it have all the other rights granted in the Bill of Rights? The Fourth Amendment against. Uh, uh, search, unfair search, yeah. you know, and right. seizure. So you're coming in, you didn't give me warning, and you're coming into my slaughterhouse, and then you're going to give me a summons or a fine. Or, or a, a fine. 
uh, that's unconstitutional. We have the same rights as individuals. Oh, that, that's the premise, and you will see this kind of fallout uh, on any number of rights that individuals are currently regarded as having, but not corporations. What's happened to the suit? Do you mind if I say a little thing about that? Um, so that's why we feel strongly that any constitutional amendment should have can, should contain two principles. The first principle being that corporations are not entitled to the same constitutional rights as people. That principle would address the very issue that um, Sylvia is talking about, where a corporation is trying to assume the Fourth Amendment rights that are um, traditionally reserved for human being people. Um, the second, the second point, uh, the second point is uh, has to do with uh, contributions and expenditures. We we see that those two things are inherently tied, um, and. There's, there's a number of other cases that are very similar to that. In, um, Jeff Clements in his book, Corporations Are Not People, talks about them um, very elegantly about, um, there was a particular case in Vermont where um, the Vermont state legislature passed a um, law requiring dairy producers to disclose in the, if uh, there was bovine growth hormone in their product. Um, and the court ended up striking down a de that democratically enacted law because it infringed on the First Amendment rights of the corporations not to speak. Because um, it didn't want to put that label on, or didn't want to put that uh, warning on its label. So there's a, you know, there's a variety of other, other instances of the same kind, but that is a particularly important one because it is one of the first one that's going beyond just the First Amendment speech rights and trying to apply another amendment, which is, you know, you can just see sort of the slippery slope of what that, where that's going. Well, one of the things I had to consider uh, before I agreed to uh, Deborah's strong arm there to speak in town and floor was as a local attorney who represents a lot of small businesses, um, a lot of small corporations. Um, you know, whether um, my position on Tommy and Floor would be inconsistent with what I preach during my you know, nine to five life, you know, which is that corporations are, are a good thing uh, for business. Can you speak up a little bit, please, Jay? Certainly. I'm sorry. One of the things I had to consider was am I personally in a conflict situation? by advising people during the day to form corporations for their small businesses and to use a corporate form uh, legally. And you know, at night at town meeting, you know, telling people that they should vote against this um, uh, decision. And you know, my conclusion obviously was that it wasn't inconsistent, that most of the corporations that we're talking about are very, very large corporations that have vast sums of money. Um, not any corporations that I'm familiar with locally, or that I have the privilege of representing. Um, so I, I, this is not really an anti-business sort of an issue. You know, it's a public, it, it's a First Amendment free speech issue, and I think that's important. Um, and I think that's something that people expressed a concern about on town meeting floor. Um, and, uh, I think we could handle that well. There was enough people who uh, were able to speak to that issue. Um, and I just pointed out as something, if you are speaking with your friends and, um, uh, about it, that uh, I think you can be consistent and be against uh, the Supreme Court decision and still uh, be in favor of uh, good, good business practices. Sure. Just to add on that, just two seconds. Um, yeah, corporations are vital components of you know, our economic life. And this resolution, the town meeting resolution, aren't condemning corporations. They're condemning um, using the corporate, the corporate benefits, the, the benefits of, of the corporate form to disproportionately influence the electoral process. Um, and I, th I think that's a very important distinction. There are certain benefits that you get from being a corporation that are listed, that uh, Stevens talks about, uh, limited legal liability, perpetual life, all these things that will allow for 
future accumulation of wealth that can then be transferred into the, that's supposed to be used in the economic sphere, but they're using the political sphere. Is it ballot question number four in the senatorial district also? So um, the way, yeah, so across the Senate district, it's going to be number four. In Falmouth, it's going to be number four. There are a few areas, Bourne, Sandwich, and I think uh, Dukes, Dukes County is going to have both questions. So the state, the Dukes County is in the state Senate district. Falmouth is not. So uh, in, in those areas that I just mentioned, they'll have question four as their state senate question, and then number five as their state rep question. So there's a couple of people that are going to be voting on two questions that are essentially the same thing. And do you know what the wording of the signs are going to be and when they're available? So um, the signs are going to be available most likely not next week, but the following week. Bill has offered to come up to Boston and pick them up. Um, everyone that would like a sign should sign up on, on the league um, sign up forms that were passed around, and uh, we'll work with you to get, get signs. And it will say, vote oh, yes on four, the top part, is, there's going to be a tagline on the top that says corporations are not people, vote okay. oh, yes on four, and then the bottom part's going to say uh, big money out of elections or something to that effect. Um, oh, it's not going to be this? It's not going to be that exact. Oh, no. All right. Are you saying Thank you. The, the reason we don't Sorry. have signed numbers, I know I'm going to say Lou, we no, can't it's hear the, you. It's the other, so it's the other Senate district that it's, I believe it's Senator Wolf. Yes. Um, that goes, that wraps all the way down the Cape in uh, Nantucket, Mark Rose, in your, uh, and Falmouth, yeah, goes up into, uh, Teresa's district up into Plymouth. The reason we don't have signs tonight is that we didn't know what the question number was going to be until two days ago. Yeah, we uh, found that out last Friday, so. <laughs> Not time enough to get signs. Kathy? Yeah. I'm just curious, if corporations are people, will that change their tax structure? It's <laughs> <laughs> a good point. Good point. You get all no. the benefits without the burdens. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, a great video that just came out, somewhat related, not to taxes per se, but um, it's uh, it's about Shell, who I guess has been caught sponsoring like torture in, in Africa, yeah. and uh, they have this the sh Shell representative on uh, on video, basically saying that the corporation should not be held liable for that. Um, essentially saying, like, trying to have a double standard of, in one case, wanting to be a person and be able to influence elections, um, in the other case, not wanting to be a person and be held liable for the actions that the, the corporation is advocating. Um, this isn't a question, actually. It's just a, a quick tip. If you need to know anything about the ballot or elections in general, go to the uh, Massachusetts Secretary of State website. I've looked through all kinds of news media trying to find out what are the questions on the ballot. Yeah. You couldn't find them. But the Secretary of State <coughs> website has good information. They unfortunately do not have the public policy questions up there yet, which is our question. Um, Did everybody hear that? Mm -hmm. Okay, fine. Gentlemen, did you have something? There's a great site called Where Do I Vote, MA.com, which is part of the Secretary of State. You type in your address and uh, it'll show you your polling location, who your current um, representatives are, and it will show you the ballot that you will see in November. So you can see each office that you're voting for and you can see every question as well. I don't believe that they have that ballot up yet, but it will be up. Um, what is the it's where do I vote ma.com. The league, Margaret, the league also in the past has had information on the league's web, league's, state league's website about uh, districts and who you're voting for and what the ballot questions are and general information mm -hmm. like that. So just go to lwvma.org. And again, I don't think it's up yet, but 
I expect it will be. Maybe too early. Many of us remember checking off the little box for public campaign finance uh, tax returns. And I wonder where all that money went over the years, and is anybody still using public campaign finance? I remember with fond memories of common cause coming up. <laughs> yeah, so there's a, there's a really interesting story about clean elections in Massachusetts that Common Cause was a, a big part of. I obviously was not part of that uh, campaign. It was a little before my time. Um, but uh, we actually helped pass by ballot question a clean elections bill, um, which was essentially uh, if a candidate raised enough small donations, they would be eligible for public financing. Um, that bill was unfortunately uh, strongly, strongly opposed by uh, the great Tom Finnerman, and uh, he actually had, he put up another question a couple of years later, uh, a public policy question like this one, asking people if they support uh, taxpayer funded candidate or campaigns. And even after they, had people had just passed clean elections by a two thirds vote, they proceeded to flip the vote, the exact opposite, saying that they do not support taxpayer-funded campaigns. And it was really all just a matter of how the question was worded at the end of the day. So that was, uh, that was revoked, and we only have one uh, legislator currently that used clean elections and actually was elected, and that's uh, Senator Jamie Eldridge. Uh, and, he, and he also um, sponsors the same bill every year. Uh, he, he files it and uh, it doesn't get a lot of traction. But at the federal level, essentially presidential public financing is completely dead um, because they can raise so much more money without it. I think McCain was the last person <coughs> will be the last person that will have accepted it. This isn't really a question, but <clears throat> it's something that you just might get a kick out of. And I understand there's a <clears throat> bumper sticker going around that says, I will believe that a corporation is a person when Texas executes one. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. 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 Anybody else? <laughs> <laughs> I would like to remind you again about the sign-up sheets. After you've heard more, perhaps you would like to put your name down if you want more information, if you want to help with the campaign in some respect, or if you'd like a sign later on. Uh, there are sign-up sheets scattered all over. I'm sure there's some in the back table. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.